So I'm going to talk about something that I didn't know anything about a year ago, and now I use every day. And I work at Riskified, and Riskified does fraud prevention using machine learning and big data and stuff like that. And we've been migrating to Scala from Ruby in the past year for obvious reasons. And Riskified is a great place to work at, right? You work with people like this. And I do backend there. So the standard library of Scala is big, right? And there are many concepts there. And some of these concepts look different, but are actually similar in many ways. Like you can map over futures, but you can also map over lists. And you can fold tries, but you can also fold other collections. And once you work with Scala for enough time, you start to wonder whether there's some pattern, whether there's some hidden <laughs> abstraction, and it might be beneficial to learn those abstractions as, as they're so common to things we use every day. And it might give us ability to abstract over those similar things. And in this talk, I'll mainly try to give the intuition about those abstractions, uh, how I understand them, and how it can make the work we do every day easier. And talking in terms of those abstractions might also make our code speak for itself. And so we won't need to talk to other developers so much. So I'm going to talk about CAT. And CAT is a library for functional programming. It contains many of those abstractions I mentioned in the form of type classes. And it also contains some data types, which I'll also talk about. And I'll try to show the power of those type classes and why functional programmers care about them. And before we start looking at the interesting type classes in CATS, let's look at a very simple one. And it's a functor. And it represents this idea of mapping of things that can be mapped over. And we can think of many things that conform to this, right? Like options and futures. Yeah, you get a function, you apply it to this structure, this f of a. And that seems abstract, so let's look at the concrete implementation. Let's look at a functor for options. How do you map over options? Well, we need to implement this functor interface, implement the map function, and we get a function, and we match pattern match over the option. If it has a value inside, we apply the function and return a sum, and if it doesn't, then we return a none, right? We, we can't apply the function. And so, how would we use that? How would we use this concept? We can define a function which requires f, a higher kind of type, to be a functor. And then we can use, we can summon this functor and use its map function. And this can work with anything that has a functor. And there's also alternative syntax for requiring this f to be a functor, and that's with the implicit. And they're very similar, they're basically equivalent. OK, so we implemented the functor instance for option. We defined a function no. requiring a functor. And now we can call it with options, or with futures, or whatever we have an instance for in scope. OK, so that seems nice, but is there anything more? Well, if we have a list of options, then using the standard library, uh, we want to add one to each one of, one of the, OK, so we have a list of options inside the list. And we want to add one to each of the numbers inside the options inside the list. And using the standard library, we'd have to map over the list and then map over the option. Great. But since we looked at this concept separately from the types, we can discover something new. And that is that functors compose. And so we can compose the functor for list with the functor for option and then map just once. And so that's an example of one type class defined in cats. And that's a nice example in isolation, right? But let's look at a real problem and try to use the type classes in cats to solve it. So most of us here are backend developers, right? And what we do all day is get some data, go to the database, get more data, make HTTP calls, get more data, and reprocess it. And some of those processing steps are dependent on one another, 
and some are independent of one another. And then in the end, we will output some data. And so basically, this is our life. And so now we're going to build a tiny JSON transformation library using cats. OK, so we are functional programmers, right? We like to represent our logic as small functions. And how might such a function that transforms JSON look like? Well, we get a JSON. We extract something from it, like the user ID. And we go to the database, we get a username, and we return another JSON. OK, now there's one small problem. Which JSON library would we use? Right, we are Scala developers. We can't commit to a JSON library. We want to be able to swap one every two weeks. And so, and so we introduce a type parameter. And we define a type, this task which takes an A and returns an A. This would be the JSONs, but we don't commit on an implementation. Great, but there's something missing, right? This representation is insufficient, because our task might not always be able to produce a JSON. We might go to the database and not find the user there. We might work with anarchist developers who like to throw exceptions, and we'd model that using a try. And we might want to have those computations happen asynchronously using a future. And so we use what we call an effect to wrap the return type of our task. And so an option models the effect of having no data, and a try models the presence of exceptions. And there's several sensible options. And choosing one, similarly to choosing a JSON library, is hard. And we might not want to commit just yet. We'd like to defer the decision for later. And so introduce another type parameter, this f, which has a, <laughs> it has a hole in it, and that's where our result is going to go. And OK, but we don't know anything about this f right now, or about this a. And that's actually a good thing. That will make us think, what exactly do we need of those f and a? in order to make a library work, a JSON lab transformation library work. OK, but that's, that's just one task and one function. And to do something interesting, we need more than one. So let's see how our model works with many functions. So here's how our library is going to work. We're going to start with an initial JSON and input. And we feed it to a stage of tasks. These are, the, these are those functions. And they're independent of each other. Right? They each get the same JSON and produce a result. And they themselves each produce a JSON. And we need to combine those to one big JSON in order to start the next stage. So that's kind of like a map reduce thingy. And the next stage, the tasks in the next stage themselves will produce a JSON and we combine it, and then there's an output at the end. Now, that's just two stages, but there can be many. And this seems um, quite, maybe it seems complicated to implement. And there are more complications, like what if a task fails? Then it has no output, and we can't really run the next stage, right? Uh, it might depend on this value that the task produced. And what if we want to add parallelism? Because the tasks inside the stage are independent of each other. OK, so it seems we have work to do. And now let's see a concrete example. Let's try to do this to implement a fraud detection algorithm. And so we get a JSON with the user ID and an email. And we take the email and we go to an external service using HTTP, which returns to us the email's age, like the first time it was seen on the web. And then for the user ID, we try to con we go to the database and get an order count. So that's like saying whether we know this user already, whether it's, it made purchases. Uh, and then there's another task which depends on, those, on both of those. And it checks if the email age is greater than one year, or the order count is greater than zero, then it's OK, else it's fraud. So that's a, actually a pretty good algorithm for fraud detection. And the code looks like this. It's very simple. We take an email out of the JSON, 
we go to the HTTP, <laughs> we do an HTTP call to the service, and we return a new JSON with the email's age. And the decision task, like whether it's fraud or not, is very similar. We extract the values produced by those previous two tasks from the JSON, and we make a decision. Okay. So that's the signature of our library, right? It takes this initial JSON and those stages of tasks that run, and it needs to return the result. The result wrapped in the effect. Cool. So the JSON corresponds to the input JSON, and the stages are those. So it's a list of lists. The inner lists are those stages, and the outer list is the whole computation. Great. And that's the code for that, right? We arrange the tasks according to the dependency order, we create the initial JSON, and we run it. And you'll notice I run it with a future and the JS value, which is JSON representation of uh, the micro JSON library, but we can also use options and JS objects, and our result would be wrapped in an option, and the JSON would be the JSON representation made by this other library. And so that seems quite flexible. And now let's see how we implement this. Okay. Okay, so first what we need to do is run the tasks, but let's say we run them, and they produce a result, and we need to combine it. Now, how does that result look? Well, tasks are functions from A to F of A, so the results are F of A themselves. And we know nothing about F and nothing about A. How can, about A. How can we combine it? Well, how do we usually combine lists of stuff in Scala? We can use fold left, right? But it requires an initial value and a combined function, and we don't have either of those for this abstract A type. And we know how to combine ints, and we know how to combine lists, so concrete types. But let's assume we had a combined function for A's. How would we use it in the fold? We just put it as the accumulation function. And let's assume we had an empty value for, the, for those A's. We could use it as the initial uh, value for the fold. And so it just happened that there's such a type class that enables us to provide those two methods, right? It allows us to, pr to provide a combined function and an empty value. And this works as you'd expect, right? We can import instances for those, for those types, like for example for int, and then the monad for int uh, does just integer addition, the default monad for int. And so empty is zero, and combine just adds int. And the same goes for list, so that's pretty much what you'd expect. And if we had a monad for A, if we required A to be a monad, then we can use those functions in our fold. And that would give us the flexibility to work with any JSON library for which the user can provide this object, this monoid, this interface. And let's, okay. And there's also an um, derived methods on the monoid in cats that enable us to do it in a shorter way. It does exactly what we did, just it's already implemented on monoid for, in cats. Okay, so that's a very simple concept, uh, but what uh, other things does representing it as a standalone interface give us? What would happen if we use plus plus from the Scala standard library to combine two maps with the same item? Right? We just get the second value, the, the value from the second map, and that's a kind of monolithic behavior, right? And we have no way to override it. But if we use the monoid instance from cats, then the values themselves will be combined using the monoid instance for ints. So that's interesting, right? We can override the behavior by providing an instance. And if that seems a bit verbose, then there's also alternative syntax, which also makes it look like the standard library. Okay, and just to show a complete monoid implementation, if we take a, just any JSON library, we can provide a combine and an empty value. The empty value would just be an empty JSON for that library. And combine would just merge JSON using um, 
merge, which is a function I just made up. But okay. So we saw how to combine those A's, but that's not what our tests produce, right? They produce those A's inside those F's, and we know nothing about those F's. How can we combine them? Well, let's assume we had some function, let's call it zip, which enables us to combine two effects. So, for example, two options or two futures. And let's look at an implementation for options. We take the two options, we pattern match over them. If they contain a value, we return a new option with a tuple containing those two values. And if they don't, we return none. If, they don't, if each of them is empty, then we have nothing to return, right? And we can define this for many types. And the type class that has this concept of combining um, values inside a container, inside a wrapper, inside an effect, is called applicative. And it has this zip method, which I just described. And it also has a pure method, which is kind of like a minimal constructor, right? It takes a value and put it in the context. So you can think of that as the option constructor or the future.successful constructor. Okay. So that would work if we, if we require our F to be an applicative, then we could combine those Fs and then combine those A's inside them. But we, this works for two tasks, right? And we might have many tasks and we need to combine many Fs. Does the zip function still help us? Let's see. Well, we zip the first two values, that works. And we're still good with three values, right? We can call zip repeatedly. And so on and so on. So there seems to be some pattern here, right? We took those many effectful values, like values wrapped in an effect, and they were each kind of doing their own thing inside their own effect, and now they're all stuck together here in this tuple, inside this one effect. And then we can map over it and do something with those values, now that they're together. And that seems like some kind of recipe, right? Like some kind of pattern. And this, we don't have to do this for anything that has an applicative. Uh, we can just use the recipe, and the recipe is called traverse. And you may know it from the future.traverse method. It takes a container, this FA, and the function, which produces an applicative, and does what we just did with zip. Right, it reverses the structure. Okay, so how does that help us to finally do what we wanted? Run a stage of tasks and combine the results and all that? Well, it's very simple. We require F to be an applicative. And we just go over the tasks and call traverse. And the types uh, work out. And this will do what we wanted. This will run the tasks and, and combine the effects. So what we did so far is we ran a stage using Traverse, we combined the results using the monoid, and if we examine the types, we started with an A, with a JSON or something, and we finished with an F of A, a JSON wrapped in the effect. And what do we need to do now? If we look at this whole thing, the type is just A to F of A, like this whole stage is in itself something that looks like a function from A to F of A. So it produces an F of A, right? And now we need to run the next stage. And it also looks the same. And so we need to feed this F of A, this result of the previous stage, to the next stage. And that looks like something, right? That looks like a flat map. And now uh, what flat map enables us to do is represent dependent computations. And what do I mean by that? Well, this f function that produces this f of b needs to be able to inspect what's inside the previous container in order to produce its result. Its result. So if you think of this f as a future, then obviously it needs to complete running before we can run this f function. And so we got this sequencing of effects. And let's see a simple map, flat map implementation. We, we, again, would implement it for an option. So we match over the option, and we need to run this, to apply this f function to an A. 
And for that, we need to take the A out of the option, and that would produce the option of B, and that's what we return. And again, it's short circuiting. If the option is empty, then we can do nothing. And so the type class that contains this concept is called uh, monad. And monads are very powerful, right? They enable us to sequence computations, but they also enable us to combine dependent effects, because they're also applicatives. You can see they extend applicative. And they also enable us to map over structures, because applicative is also a functor. And so that's kind of everything we need of f in order to be able to run this whole computation graph. So let's see the type classes we talked about. We talked about monad for combining values, uh, functors for working with single effects, applicative for working with two effects, and traverse for swapping structures, and monad for working with dependent effects. And now we have kind of this ability to work with the effect in our program. So let's see how we can tie it all together. And that's what we want to build, right? This computation graph, this JSON transformation library. And we need to implement the run method we saw at the beginning. And we need to require f to be a monad and a to be a monad. Like, that's what we discovered, right? And now we need to run the stages. There are two cases. One possibility is that we're done. There are no more stages to run. And then we just return our input or that there's more stages. And if there's more stages, we need to run the current one and then somehow run the rest. And so that's what we'll do using those type classes, right? We'll run the stage using traverse. We combine the result using the monoid. And we recursively call the run method with the rest of the stages on the combined outputs. And so this, uh, this, is where, this is where we use those type classes. And that's all, right? That's five or six lines to implement this whole computation graph in a way that is sane, like it handles errors in the same way, it short circuits. Once there's an error, we get, we, the whole computation stops. And it's abstract, right? It can run with any effect. But what else did we get? So one thing is the flexibility we wanted. We can run with futures and JS values from micro JSON, but we can also run with options, or we can also run with another JSON library. And our program would work just the same. And another thing we got is that we got a standard language, right? We can look at those signatures and we can see what the method requires, what capabilities it requires of the effects, and what capabilities it requires of the values. And that's kind of like passing to a function the minimal number of arguments. You pass to a function the minimal amount of capabilities it needs in order to run. And so there's less API surface, less things to test. And if you talk about testing, then sometimes when we're testing, we don't want the result wrapped in this effect, right? Wrapped in a future or in our, an option. We just want to test our logic. We just want to get the JSON out, not wrapped in anything. And there's a problem, right? Because our run method requires this F to be a higher kind of type. And the JSON is not a higher kind of type, it's just a value. But it turns out cats has a solution, right? There's this, this ID monad, and it's just a type of, alias for a value, but it also has a monad instance, so you can map over it and you can flat map over it. And if we run our program with the future, then the result would be wrapped in the future. But if we run our program with ID, the result would just be unwrapped, because ID is just a type alias. And so that's pretty useful, right? Working with futures in testing is harder than working with just the values. And another cool thing we did is we separated the data in a program, those A's, those JSONs, from the effect, from how the program flows, from how we sequence stages, from how we handle errors, which is modeled by this F. 
And so the flow of our program is represented by types. And we can look at types and we can understand what our program does. And so if we look here, we implemented this traverse sequentially, right? We applied zip iteratively to each two values. But our tasks are independent. They can run in parallel. And so by just a minor change, by requiring another type class called parallel, uh, we can use this part traverse method and everything else just works, but we now run stages in parallel, which is cool. So what we did was use cat's type classes to implement a JSON transformation library whose code is very short, it's very abstract, it's flexible, it's easy to test. And that's what we did talk about. What, what we didn't talk about is, well, there's laws, right? So you can't implement those type classes any way you want. And those laws are like tests and they give us additional capabilities to reason about our program and they also enable type classes to depend on one another in a sane way. And there are data types in CATS which implement those interfaces, those, those type classes, and those effects other than the ones in the standard library like option and future which enable to manage state, for example. And there's other sub-projects like CATS effect which, in, which allows us to track I.O. operations as an effect, which is very useful. And Monix for reactive programming and streaming libraries, and they all talk together in terms of those type classes, right? That's what they standardize on. And if you want to learn more, then I recommend these books, Scala with Cats by Underscore, it's a free book. Uh, Functional Programming in Scala, the red book, which has great exercises and just following pull requests and looking at the cat's documentation. And there's supposed to be some metaphor here, but I don't know what it is. Uh, but that's my, well, that's my favorite Instagram cat. And thank you for listening.